I'm Joel Westheimer. I'm a professor of education at the University of Ottawa in Ontario, Canada. I want to talk to you today about democracy in education, specifically the role of schools in a democratic society. And I'm going to start with a thought experiment. If you can imagine that wherever you are, you're sitting in your chair and you close your eyes and the chair that you're sitting in suddenly starts to shake a little and it starts to go up in the air and it starts to go higher and higher. It goes through the ceiling of the room that you're in, through the next floor and the next floor and the next floor and out the ceiling, out the roof of the building. And you keep going up and up through the air. You see the city down below. You go up and up and up until you're through the atmosphere, through space, and you're floating around in space. And you look down and you see the earth turning below you. And it's beautiful. And remember, this is a thought experiment, so we can pretend that you can breathe and do whatever you're doing up there. And you're there for a little while enjoying the view, but suddenly you, your chair starts to shake again. And you start to come down, 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 through the stratosphere, through the atmosphere, down into the air. You see a city below. You go down through a building, through the roof, through some floors, and boom, you land in a room. But this isn't just any room. It's a classroom and you see a lesson going on. And again, because it's a thought experiment, let's pretend you can't tell where you are based on the clothes people are wearing or the language they're speaking. But you watch a lesson, a lesson going on with the teacher and the students. And here's my question for this experiment. Would you be able to tell whether you had landed in a classroom in a democratic country, say France or Switzerland or Canada, um, or did you land in a country in a totalitarian dictatorship or a country ruled by a military junta? Um, think about that for just a minute. Would you be able to tell based on the lesson that you're observing? Most of us would like to think that of course we could tell the difference, that lessons in Norway or France or Belgium would look nothing like the lessons in North Korea or China, that there would be differences. But when you think about it, a lot of those lessons might be the same. If we think about fractions, learning to add numbers, learning to divide numbers, or chemistry lesson, learning to balance the equation, or learning a foreign language, or a science lesson, maybe everyone's learning the life cycle of a glowworm, a lot of those lessons might be the same. And so this brings me to ask another different kind of question. What, if anything, should be different in schools in a democratic society than in schools in a totalitarian dictatorship. If there are differences, what should those differences be? And I have some ideas about that. You might also. The first idea that I have is that citizens in these two different types of nations have very different responsibilities. Because in a totalitarian dictatorship or a monarchy, uh, or a country ruled by a military junta, the leaders want people not to ask questions about decisions the leaders make. They want people to obey the rules, follow the law, show up to work on time, pay taxes, and basically go around about their life and leave the decisions up to leaders. But citizens in a democratic society have different kinds of responsibilities because in a democratic society, we are charged with governing our own lives. It goes back to the old Thomas Jefferson quotation that's something like this. If the people are not well educated enough to govern their own affairs, then the solution is not to take that power of governance away from them, but to educate them. And that gives us a little hint about the role of schools in democratic societies. Because in democratic societies, people need to be taught to ask questions, to come together and work out their differences through compromise and policy so that they can move forward and set the rules by which we all live our lives. So first characteristic of schooling in a democratic society should be that people learn to ask questions. A second characteristic of schools in a democratic society is that we need to teach students to deal with multiple perspectives. Because again, remember in a totalitarian dictatorship, there's only one perspective and it's handed on from down high. It's handed down like two tablets from a top mountaintop. No one should question that. The leader 
the, the ruler or the dictator knows what's best for those people. And let's make this experiment even a little more difficult. Let's say it's a benevolent dictator. This dictator is not a, a, a horrible person squirreling money off in the Cayman Islands and corrupting, appointing their relatives and friends to positions. No, this is a, a, a leader who wants the best for their people. Even that benevolent dictator is not going to want the people to ask questions or to question his or her decisions. He might have a ruling junta that helps him make decisions, but he's going to want the people to just follow those decisions. In a democratic society, we have people with many different ideas about how we should live. And that might be one of the most important questions in a democratic society. How should we live? So schools should prepare students for that question, to ask questions about policy, to ask questions about how we should live, to be able to deal with multiple perspectives, because we have to be able to work out our differences and move forward towards policy that benefits us all. So you see, I think that schools in democratic societies do have differences than schools in a totalitarian dictatorship, and we need to bring out those differences. Now, sometimes people say, wait a minute, politics, we should keep politics out of the school. Um, because politics in our culture is sometimes treated like a dirty word. It's like it's a four letter word, even though it's not. But politics has a much more, you know, politics we sometimes say is um, like, like if I say, oh my goodness, you're just being political. It's like an insult. Like I'm calling you a mudslinging candidate just interested in his own advancement and not interested in the benefit of the people. But politics has a much more noble history to it. Politics, for example, Bernard Crick wrote a wonderful book called In Defense of Politics. And in it, he says that politics are the way that people come together in a democracy to work out their differences and move forward towards setting social policy for, our greater, for the greater good. So politics has a noble meaning. And in that sense, I think far from keeping politics out of the school, we need to bring politics in. We need to have students deal with controversial issues of our times to understand that there are well-meaning, thoughtful adults who differ on their opinions on important matters of social concern. And they need practice dealing with those differences. Now, ideally, schools would bring this into every part of the curriculum, not just in social studies classes, not just in English classes, but across the curriculum and through the curriculum. The very architecture of the school should dictate that students are a part of making history, a part that their opinions matter, that their values matter, that their convictions matter. Everything in the school should scream those messages. And yet schools don't always do that. Sometimes we have classrooms set up where students are in rows and the only person that matters is the teacher because students can barely even see each other when they talk. Sometimes the whole architecture of the school is built such that students can't congregate or gather in places where they can talk with each other and work out differences in opinions that they have. Often in schools, students never witness teachers talking to one another. Dan Lordy called the, the school the egg crate version of schools, where every teacher is in a little egg crate container and never sees other teachers. But it can be important for students to see teachers interact with one another and maybe if in, even disagree with one another so that they know that adults have disagreements but can work out their differences and live together. And that's what we need in a democratic society. Now, one of the obstacles that schools face in trying to bring these things into, into school and into the curriculum is a very limited idea of what curriculum is and what should be taught in schools. For the last 20 or 30 years in school reform, not just in Canada or the United States, but around the world, we've seen many schools focusing almost all of their attention on only two subject areas because we've seen a radical increase in the amount of standardized testing that's going on in schools. And those standardized tests tend to only be in two subject areas, math and literacy. And of course, those subject areas are important. You'll never find a group called uh, parents and teachers against kids knowing how to read or parents and teachers against kids knowing how to add numbers. But when we think about democratic schooling, 
We want a lot more than kids just learning how to read or knowing how to decode the words of a sentence. We want kids also to be able to know what's worth reading and to know how that reading links to their life outside of school. The same with math. We want kids to be able to add numbers or get the correct change at a grocery store, of course. Everyone wants that. But many people, those people who think that schooling is about more than that, think that students also need to know what those numbers add up to. Again, how that knowledge links to their life outside of school, why it's relevant. And of course, we need to know knowledge that moves much beyond just math and literacy. We need to pay attention to social studies and to history and to science and to the arts and even to recess. All of these things make the kind of well-rounded person that democracies require. So schools in democratic societies need to be able to deal with these subjects in a much broader way. And unfortunately, because of standardized testing, we know from research that the curriculum has been narrowed because what gets tested gets taught. And so one of the things I like to argue for is loosening the chains that these standardized tests place on schools and place on teachers. We want teachers to be able to have time and the space to explore these many different qualities and skills and knowledge and attitudes that make democracies strong. Because we need schools in democratic societies to teach students to be not just good citizens, but democratic citizens. Now my book, What Kind of Citizen? Educating Our Children for the Common Good, lays out a typology that we found from research. My colleague Joe Kahn and I began this research many years ago, and many people around the world have been doing research with this typology ever since. So let me just tell you a little bit about that typology. We looked at programs that said they were aiming to teach good democratic citizenship. And we wanted to see what those programs had in common or what differences they had. And we found that most of these programs could fall loosely into three categories, because you know how professors like to put things in categories. It doesn't mean that every program fit neatly into one of these boxes, but it does mean that this gave us a common vocabulary to talk about what the goals of these different programs were. The whole time we were doing this research, we were asking, what kind of citizen do these programs imagine? How do they see students and adults being good citizens in a society? The three kinds of good citizens that we came up with from these programs were called the personally responsible citizen, the participatory citizen, as in participation, and the social justice oriented citizen. And I'll tell you just a little bit about those three types of citizens. The personally responsible citizen is a vision of a good citizen of like a good person, a good neighbor. This kind of citizen uh, pays their taxes, obeys the law, doesn't litter, doesn't do drugs, comes to work or school on time, helps an old person across the street during uh, you know, a traffic jam, um, gives blood when blood is needed, let's say there was a storm. A good person, the kind of person you'd want to live next to. That was the personally responsible kind of citizen. The second type of citizen that we, we found in these programs, and there are many programs, by the way, that embrace this vision of a good citizen. A lot of programs called character education programs would promote personally responsible citizenship. But we also found programs that embrace this second vision of a good citizen. The participatory citizen are programs that value that kind of citizenship are programs that want to emphasize participation, that students should know how government works, know how the laws of the land work, and participate in helping to make those laws a reality. So a, a participatory citizen might, for example, organize a food drive if people uh, were hungry in their community. And if they were doing that, the personally responsible citizen would be donating cans of food because they're good people. Right now, And there are programs that pursue this participatory vision of citizenship. But remember I said there were three kinds. The third vision of a good citizen we called the social justice oriented citizen. And these are programs that ask students to look at the root causes of problems and try and figure out solutions to move forward. 
So these programs might teach students about how social change happens, how social movements happened in history. They want students to participate, like the participatory citizens, but they also want students to ask difficult questions about how we got here and why we are here and what we can change to make a difference. So if, we, if I use that example I gave before, if participatory citizens are organizing a food drive, personally responsible citizens are donating a can of food, the social justice oriented citizens might be asking something like this. How come in a wealthy country, perhaps in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, we have people who are hungry? And what can we do about that? What can we do to make sure those people get fed? What can we change about the structures of society that can improve the way that everyone lives together? Now that kind of citizen is the one that we found and continue to find is the vision of a good citizen that's least represented in school-based programs. There are lots of individual teachers who are doing wonderful things around this vision of a good citizen, but systemically, Systemically, the vast majority of school-based programs pursue a personally responsible vision of, good, of a good citizen and don't pursue participatory or social justice-oriented visions. Now, I want to say one other thing about these three visions of a good citizen. Although all of them might be desirable, we certainly want people who help an old person across the street and is a good person. We want people who participate in their community, and we want people who ask questions about how to solve deep-seated social and political and economic problems. But while all three of those might be valuable, and we might value all of those for, our, for a good society, the personally responsible citizen does not really have to do with democratic citizenship. There's not a country in the world that wouldn't be happy if people obey the law and people help old people across the street and help out in a flood and don't litter and don't do drugs and pay their taxes. Every leader of every country in the world, including totalitarian dictatorships or monarchies or military juntas, everyone wants that kind of citizen. So when I say that schools need to teach democratic citizenship, I'm drawing attention to the importance of both participatory citizenship and social justice-oriented citizenship, because those are the things that make democracies strong. And right now, we know that we need a lot. It's very important that we strengthen our commitments to democratic institutions, because around the world, those democratic institutions are under attack. I'll close with this quote by a philosopher of education who uh, I very much adore, um, was a friend and a mentor of mine, Maxine Green. She died some years ago. She was 97 years old. And Maxine Green once said this. She said, the purpose of education is to comfort the troubled and trouble the comfortable. And I love that quote as a sort of guiding way to think about the purpose of schools, because of, of course schools need to be safe places where students feel comfortable, comfortable to try out new ideas and to fail, free from bullying, free from harm. Schools need to be safe places where students feel comfortable. But in a democratic society, that's not enough, because students also need to be challenged. Their comfort needs to be troubled. Schools need to be places where we trouble the comfortable because we need students to know that there are issues in the world that need their help, that there are problems that need solving. And so if schools embrace that vision of what a good school is and what a good education is, I think our democracies can rebound and be strong in the way that we need them to be.